On the 21st of May 1927, Charles Lindbergh landed an aeroplane in Le Bourget, Paris, after flying 33 hours non-stop from New York. It was the first time it had been done, and he did it in an aircraft built for him by Ryan Airlines, an obscure charter company based in San Diego. Although Claude Ryan had already sold his share of Ryan Airlines, and accounts disagree on whether he was even involved in the production of Lindbergh's aircraft, he took the Ryan brand with him to new ventures. In 1931 he began work on a new aircraft, the ST, which was to become the first product of a new company, the Ryan Aeronautical Corporation. The ST was a very modern looking aircraft, built predominantly of metal, with a low wing monoplane configuration and fully fared landing gear. It was powered by a Monasco B4 Pirate, which was an inverted four-cylinder inline engine, and which gave the fuselage a distinctive elliptical cross-section. The ST was fast, given the Pirate's modest 90 horsepower, and it was followed shortly by the STA, using the 125 horsepower C4 Pirate, and then the STA Special, which used a supercharged version of the C4. The STA created a stir, setting a number of speed and altitude records and winning the 1937 International Aerobatic Championships. But perhaps more significantly, it came to the attention of the Mexican Air Force, which in 1937 placed an order for six STA specials. These were adapted for military use, essentially with wider cockpits to allow the use of parachutes, and the model was designated STM. Before long, Ryan also made deals with several other Latin American air forces to supply the STM, and sales continued into the 1940s. Meanwhile, in 1939, the US Army Air Corps acquired an STA, which they designated XPT-16, PT for primary trainer, and on the basis of their tests, subsequently ordered 15 more as YPT-16, and then a further 30 as PT-20s. Modifications to these aircraft included not only widening of the cockpits but also student proofing them with sturdier construction and the addition of a roll bar. They also added a parking brake and height adjustable seats. Now the Monasco engines proved less than reliable at the hands of student pilots and throughout 1940 Ryan tried a number of alternatives in the STA, most notably the Kinner R440 radio engine. The Kinner is a very different engine to the Pirate. Its long cylinders and starfish appearance hark back to the early Gnome rotary engines and its looks have also been compared rather uncharitably, you might think, to a boat anchor but it was a simple and very reliable engine with a respectable power output. Committing to the radial engine, Ryan redesigned the fuselage with a rounder cross-section. Ryan called the new model the ST3, the Army called it PT-21 and bought 100. And finally, in 1941, the engine was upgraded to the 160 horsepower Kinner R540. The only other change was the decision to remove all fairings from the landing gear. This was a concession to the disproportionate amount of maintenance which the gear of a primary trainer demanded. The civilian designation of this model was ST3KR, but we know it best as the PT-22 recruit. The Army bought a thousand. Although the STA had shown promise as a competition aircraft, its evolution into the PT-22 was driven by the needs of the Army Air Corps, and it was used overwhelmingly in the role of the primary trainer. The Ryan was the US Army Air Corps' first monoplane primary trainer, and whether by accident or design, it was an aircraft that was more challenging to fly than its contemporaries. This was good or bad, depending on how you looked at it, because it turned out better pilots, but killed more trainees in the process. In fact, the PT-22 acquired a reputation as a dangerous aircraft. One of the reasons for this was its unforgiving stall and spin characteristics, and it has been said that the PT-22 handles more like an 86 Texan than a primary trainer. If you compare the STA and the PT-22 side by side, you'll notice a subtle difference. The STA's wings are straight, while the PT-22s are swept back. The PT-22 was about 400 pounds heavier than the STA, and the swept wings were likely a fix to reposition the center of gravity. It's only a four degree sweep, but it's enough to add 20 miles per hour to the stall speed. It also introduced a tendency for the wings to stall at the outboard ends first, which made spins more likely and spin entry more abrupt. The PT-22 is reasonably fast for a trainer, but that high stall speed, about 65 miles per hour, makes it particularly challenging in the circuit because you need to keep the speeds up. Takeoff is comfortable at about 80 miles per hour, with elevator trim set significantly after neutral. 
and final approach is typically flown at 85 miles per hour. It will fly slower obviously but in the real aircraft that puts you closer to most of the classic stall spin situations and hence slow flight is to be avoided. The simulated PT-22 is more forgiving and you actually have to provoke it quite hard to stall, let alone spin. In normal operations you're most likely to stall it if you let the speed fall off in a turn or if you're trying to haul it out of too short a field by brute force. Once in the air the aircraft is responsive but not twitchy and it needs quite a lot of rudder in turns to keep the ball centred. Climb rate is modest, so about 700 feet per minute if you're lucky, and isn't helped by flaps, so it isn't much use for short field operations. It'll cruise quite comfortably at 110 miles per hour, and it will sustain up to about 130 in spite of all those lumps and wires sticking out into the airflow. The view's great, so it makes a nice touring aircraft with the portable GPS for navigating. PT-22 is fully aerobatic and will manage most common manoeuvres without fuss, although as with many aircraft in FSX this is where the limits of the flight modelling really show, and anything that relies on auto rotation doesn't really work right. According to one pilot report for example, this aircraft should easily do a snap roll with modest rudder input to stall the inside wing, but as I said you have to work quite hard to get this aircraft even to drop a wing. One of the most challenging manoeuvres for any aircraft of course is the approach, so it's worth spending a bit of time looking at that. Now it comes as no surprise that one of the limiting factors here is forward visibility, as with most aircraft of this era. The PT-22 has conventional gear, and fairly tall gear at that, and you fly it from the back seat, which means you can't really see where you're going during the approach. That high approach speed too means that you run out of space very quickly, so precision is important. I recommend you use the flaps on approach for two reasons, both consistent with real world operations. First you get a modest nose down concession and second you increase the rate of descent or more significantly you reduce the aircraft's tendency to float in the round out. At these approach speeds it's very easy to balloon if you flare too quickly or to bounce if you flare too slowly and it pays to come in with power on until the very last minute to help minimise the descent rate. So now you have to decide how you're going to get it down in the right place. On a field, literally, like this one, we have quite a bit of leeway, so flying it in forwards is doable. With a head tracker, such as Track IR, we can actually lean out and keep a check on our track, which is a realistic benefit of the Ryan's slender fuselage. We can also fly the approach on an arc instead of straight in, which helps with orientation. In the flare we need to put our heads back inside and we lose all forward visibility and we have to rely on peripheral vision and manage the flare carefully to put it down in a three point landing. We can land it on the main wheels first which increases forward visibility but this means keeping the speed up and we need lots of space to do that. Another approach, so to speak, is to fly the aircraft in a forward slip all the way to the ground by crossing the controls. We still have to straighten out at the last minute and this makes complete precision in the flare even trickier. The PT-22 does slip well, provided you give it lots of rudder. You'll find it needs very little aileron to keep it sliding with the engine at idle, but progressively more aileron under power. Now these techniques all work well for a field or a wide runway, but for real precision, even in still air, I found it really difficult without looking over the nose. You can do that by moving the eye point up and down. I've mapped the up and down functions to a couple of joystick buttons so I can adjust them on the fly as you see here and remember the PT-22 has adjustable seats so it's kind of what real world pilots do anyway. In fact if you pop up high enough you can keep an eye on the airspeed indicator in the front cockpit. Not very realistic perhaps but credit to Golden Age for having modelled it. And you can also fly it from the front cockpit but again that's not how you do it in real life. Once on the ground stopping can be a bit of a problem as the brakes are very ineffective Ground handling is otherwise excellent, with very effective tailwheel steering and again with plenty hanging over the side to see where you're going. The US Army Air Corps used the PT-22 as a trainer right up to the end of the Second World War, although with around 1300 produced in total, the PT-22 never approached the numbers of its main rivals, the PT-17 Stearman or the Fairchild PT-19. Exports of the Manasco powered STM continued throughout the early 40s, notably to China and the Dutch East Indies, and about 30 of those escaped to Australia after the Japanese invasion of Java, where they were put to use by the Royal Australian Air Force. 
But that's not quite the end of the story. While many PT-22s survived the war and still fly today, there are records of at least three having been modified by private owners with a 220 horsepower Continental radial engine, more commonly found on the front end of a Stearman biplane. This is one of them. The surprising thing is that once airborne, this flies pretty much like the standard aircraft, although it can go considerably faster and obviously it accelerates better. That cowling makes the engine much fatter, which restricts the view even more, and takeoffs and landings need to be even faster, with around 90 miles per hour being the recommended approach speed. Pretty much all the comments on landing the standard PT-22 apply, but pilot reports suggest a landing on the main wheels as the preferred technique. So that's the Ryan PT-22, or ST-3KR. It's an idiosyncratic aeroplane, to some eyes quite beautiful. Ryan did, in fact, produce a wood and fabric version of the ST-3, the ST-4, but only one was ever built. The PT-22, with its polished aluminium fuselage and wire-braced fabric-covered wings, must, in its day, have seemed an odd mix of antique and ultra-modern design, but it's a mix that made it an iconic aircraft, and it's one that still turns heads today.